welcome. Come on in. Uh, we have people still coming into the room. We are live on Zoom as well. Um, hello, my name is Benjamin Paylock. I am the director of the Center for Refugees European Liberation Studies at the University of Michigan. Uh, it is my very sincere pleasure to welcome Professor Ainsley Morse of Dartmouth College, um, which I sometimes see at Dartmouth University. Which is it? It's definitely the college. Okay, good. <laughs> Dartmouth <laughs> College. <laughs> times. So it is a college. So Dartmouth, uh, from Dartmouth College. Um, uh, I will introduce her uh, momentarily. First, I want to make sure that I announce uh, some events that we have coming up. Uh, at the center uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, first, on February 15th, these are all, of course, listed here. Uh, on February 15th at noon, we will have um, uh, a lecture sponsored by the Copernicus Center for Polish Studies uh, entitled Other Kinds of Beauty, Aesthetic Valuation and the Making of Cities in Eastern Europe that will be delivered by Anastasia Halai Unagova. Is a postdoc a researcher at the Center for Sociological Research at the Academy University of Leuven in Belgium. This is sponsored by the Copernicus Center as well as the Center for Recognition of European Eurasian Studies and the Center for European Studies. Uh, that will be taking place right here in the same room. Uh, the following Monday on the 20th, we have the distinguished lecture uh, sponsored by the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. Uh, entitled The War in Ukraine One Year On. Uh, we are very excited to welcome Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, formerly Director of European Affairs, Director of European Affairs for the United States Security Council. This uh, will be a rather large event. Please come early if you have the ability to do so. Uh, the sponsors are the Weiser Center for European Eurasia, the Center for Eurasian European Eurasian Studies, the Wallace House Center for Journalists, WDC, Weiser Diplomacy. Weiser Diplomacy Center, thank you, and Slavic Languages and Literatures. And this will be held in Rackham Auditorium in the Rackham building, um, just a, a bit north of us. Um, and there will be, uh, following the event, a candlelight vigil uh, uh, for those suffering in Ukraine. And then on the 22nd, the following Wednesday, you can see we have plenty going on. We have another Greece noon lecture. Uh, this will be delivered by Valerie Sperling, professor of political science at Clark University. Her talk is entitled Unpacking Traditional Values in Rough with Conservative Turn, Gender, Sexuality, and the Soviet Legacy, sponsored by our own center, Greece, as well as the Department of Political Science, and that again will be right here. So there's plenty of stuff going on, as usual. Um, we will do our best to make sure that the audio works so that we're able to record these events and archive them online for those of you who are unable to attend in person. And, um, and also, uh, all of these will be simulcast live over Zoom, as this event is as well, which is why I ought to offer this one additional programming note. We will be having a discussion with Professor Morse following the talk, and those who are joining us live over Zoom are invited to participate as well. If you have a question or comment, please keep it relatively short. Sometimes we will consolidate multiple questions and comments in one, uh, and I will then tee them up for Professor Morse to respond. So if you have, following the talk, if you have questions or comments and you're joining us over Zoom, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Now to the main event. It is a great pleasure to welcome Ainsley Morris, Assistant Professor of Russian and Comparative Literature at Dartmouth College. We've been looking forward to this event for a long time. In fact, we've been, oh, Jesus. I'm uh, sorry. We've been looking. I'm so excited. I'm not going to think over. Uh, we've been really looking forward to this event. We actually had almost a companion <laughs> event last uh, fall when. Um, uh, Alexander Bozovich, uh, who has collaborated with Professor Morse on, um, on a recent uh, publishing project, was here talking about that project. And we uh, we were uh, immediately thinking, okay, so how do we get Ainsley Morse here uh, again to campus? Um, 
Professor Morris is, uh, is the author of uh, a recent book, Wordplay, Experimental Poetry and Soviet Children's Literature, which traces the long history of the relationship between experimental aesthetics and Soviet children's books. From the earliest days of the Soviet project, children's literature, he uh, uh, demonstrates, was, was taken unusually seriously. Its quality and subject matter were, in fact, issues of great political significance. Yet it, it was often written and illustrated by experimental writers and artists who found the childlike aesthetic congenial to their experiments in primitivism, minimalism, and other avant-garde trends. Uh, in the more repressive environment of the 30s, experimental aesthetics were largely relegated to unofficial and underground literature, but unofficial writers continued to author children's books. By the end of the Soviet uh, period, there was an unspoken consensus that children's literature was perhaps the best part of the Soviet literary canon. Meanwhile, children, the childlike aesthetic frequently migrated into unpublished and unofficial poetry as well, offering new forms and forms of poetic subjectivity for underground authors. The talk that Professor Marcus Morse is going to deliver today will introduce this book and some of its protagonists while also uh, allowing us space for discussion the note actually says also indulging a discussion. I like that. <laughs> so people indulge a discussion of their work as a specific, specifically post-war phenomenon. How might the same childlike lexical and formal elements, abundant humor and childlike lyric speakers, which served as markers of unofficial aesthetics additionally participate in articulating wartime and post-war experience, likewise excluded from official narratives. Uh, so you already have a good sense of Professor Morse's research interests. I should also note that she is uh, one of our most uh, productive, uh, not to, one could say prolific, but I prefer productive and artful translators of 20th century uh, and contemporary uh, Russian poetry from a wide range of uh, geographies and aesthetics for output is truly uh, exceptional. Uh, and I look forward to hearing mm -hmm. her speak on this work mm -hmm. today. Please join me in welcoming. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. This is a very generous introduction. Um, I changed a little bit of what I'm going to, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about uh, contemporary war slash anti-war poetry as the supplement to, to discussing the book. Um, so this is very, this is a great delight for me in many ways. Um, first of all, I actually got to talk about the wordplay book, um, I guess a year and a half ago, pretty soon after it came out, I was invited as part of a seminar that Anya Eitzman was teaching. So some of you may have heard parts of this talk before and I hope you won't be bored um, but I am I am going to I am going to have a bit of a different focus today. Um, another uh, point of reference for being here in Ann Arbor is that I was here 10 years ago, around the time that I was actually starting work on the dissertation um, that eventually I finished and then turned into a book. Um, and this is, of course, also around the time getting close to a 10 year anniversary of the beginning of the war in Ukraine. And I was in Moscow, I was staying in Moscow doing research, initial research for, for this book um, when Maidan happened um, and everything started to go down the tubes. And I was hanging out with contemporary poets, um, which was another kind of point of inspiration for the work that led to the book. Uh, because of stuff that I was observing that was happening in contemporary poetry. And uh, thinking back on it now, I was really struck by how there was not a huge response in contemporary poetry to the start of the war in Ukraine, um, um, which is in direct contrast to what has been happening over the past year in contemporary Russian, Russian language poetry. Um, so it's really been just recently that I've been making connections between some of the ideas that I discuss in this book and then some of what people are doing in contemporary poetry. Uh, so it's sort of, for me, a, a really new vector for the lines of inquiry 
that I get into in this book. Um, <clears throat> so what I hope to do today is give a fairly concise overview of the book and then talk, try to leave some time for talking about what I think of as a kind of new, new relevance of some of these ideas for um, really talking about the war through the, by means of poetry. Um, so the, uh -oh. Let's see. okay, oh, sorry, that was supposed to come earlier. This is just some of the contemporary poets of the 90s and 2000s who I do discuss in the book and who in some ways are really the starting point for it, which is a little counterintuitive because the book follows a chronological narrative that starts in the pre-revolutionary period. But I, for me, the beginning of the book is there. Um, but uh, to just dive in, the foundational idea uh, that I work with in the book is this idea of a childlike aesthetic. Um, this is, of course, a basic tendency of modernist aesthetics. It is not unique to the Russian context at all. Uh, Benjamin in the blurb mentioned already primitivism, uh, minimalism, these kind of these tendencies that are common to that movement. Um, for me in the book, as I will justify hopefully a bit further, some of the features of the childlike aesthetic that interest me, uh, specifically in poetry, a child speaker or a childlike speaker, um, childlike viewpoint, uh, language that we would associate with children, sometimes even nonsense language, baby talk, um, mistakes, right? Which uh, if anybody here is into the avant-garde, you know how much avant-garde loves mistakes. Um, uh, and all of these factors combine to, or the assumption is that they convey a more immediate, clear-eyed, uh, sensorially impressionable take on the world. Um, so in some ways, the child is like the ideal poet, right? It's obviously, it's very abstracted and fantasy version of what a actual child is, but that's the idea that, that people are working with. Um, and as far as the Russian avant-garde goes, um, this was a very, uh, a, a pretty central part of some of the theories and ideas that the Russian avant-garde was working with. Um, this is Gancharo, Natalia Gancharova working with the idea of a kind of childlike slash folk aesthetic because uh, these theoreticians of the early avant-garde, they would say, you know, well, uh, we don't have you know, like the French were inspired by um, supposedly primitive African masks. We don't have anything like that, but we have our own narod, we have our own people, right? They're kind of childlike. Uh, and then um, they also went and and basically exploited actual children. So this is a, a one of the uh, very DIY publications of the early pre-revolutionary pre avant-garde. This is Alexei Kuchonik. He went basically to all of his friends who had kids and collected their stories and drawings. So um, if you actually dig around in this publication, you find like, oh, that's Kulbin's daughter or something. You know, that's, uh, these are all ident actual identifiable children. Um, uh, one uh, example that I'll give, because I want to get through this fairly quickly, is um, another foundational figure of the pre-revolutionary avant-garde, Yelena Guro. Um, I, I focus on her both because I like to highlight her work. Um, she was one of the only, she was the only noticeable like writer of the avant-garde. There were many prominent women painters. Um, and uh, she really leans heavy into the childlike aesthetic. Uh, for those of you who don't read Russian, the title of her best known collection is, you could translate as Little Baby Sky Camels. Um, and uh, that kind of gives you a sense for the mood and aesthetic of this work, both uh, of, of the poems and, and prose vignettes that go into this 1914 book. Um, one example that I will just uh, read for you, I'll read the Russian, you can follow in the English. Um, this is a poem from that book. Uh, Разъехались бархатные ушки, а кот растит. На болоте качались беловатики, 
Жил-был ботик-животик, воркотик, дуратик, котик-пушатик, пушончик, беловатик, кошуратик, потасик. Um, <clears throat> so this is not a poem that was published for children. It appeared in a very small press run handmade avant-garde book. Um, but this was the kind of aesthetic that was inspiring for Yelena Guro and for, for her milieu. Um, so this would not be out of place, you could say, in a children's book, right? Um, <clears throat> but this was being read and discussed by a bunch of uh, experimentally minded adults. Um, so Guro was, so I go, ah, yeah, so Guro uh, in her work to an overwhelming extent was interested in inhabiting this kind of gentle, innocent, childlike viewpoint. Um, uh, you could say that she is reaching for a sort of lost harmony, right? The kind of uh, pre-fall sort of condition. Um, but her immediate circle, like Alexei Kruchonik, Valimir Klyabnikov, other early futurists, um, were many of them were interested in the childlike for more of what you could call a juvenile delinquent angle. Um, so challenging all different kinds of authority, um, the sort of the kid who says that the emperor has no clothes, right? Um, uh, breaking things, right? So I, 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 in the book, I go into some uh, depth on the concept of zaum. Uh, I won't talk about it here now, but this is, you could think of as a way of breaking language. Um, so kind of a brave new world thing. And uh, ch the childlike aesthetic really brings both of these things together, right? Uh, or it, 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 there is no contradiction um, necessarily between this gentle, soft, innocent thing and this uh, brash, um, <clears throat> fresh eyes on old on old matters thing. Um, and you can imagine that uh, the kind of the, the, the sort of uh, branch of the avant-garde that gets into early Soviet aesthetics following the revolution is more of the brave new world end of things, um, but both get carried over. So um, this takes me directly into how this idea of a childlike aesthetic relates to literature written for actual children, right? Um, so again, uh, in the introduction, you got to hear some the basic thesis of the of the book about the profound significance that children's literature had for the in the early Soviet period, the role that it played in the project of making a whole new world, a whole new society. Um, <clears throat> Karni Chukovsky is one of the two primary architects, was one of the two primary architects of uh, early Soviet literature, children's literature. He was also someone, uh, again, if for, for those of you who work on the avant-garde, he was very interested in futurism um, and in the kinds of language experiments that the pre-revolutionary futurists were engaged in. Um, and so in this book, which Little Children, which he put out in 1928. Uh, it later became um, a, a, a many, a very prominent work of, I don't know, Soviet children's culture theory that was published and republished under the title From Two to Five, at Vuk de Piti. This was the first edition. Um, he quotes Klyabnikov, he quotes Daniel Harms, who I'll mention in a, in a moment. Um, and he suggests basic commonalities between how children like to experiment with language or even are sort of hardwired to experiment with language and what some of these experimental poets are doing. And he also connects that in a didactic fashion with how one should write for children. He puts forth this idea that uh, one should be attentive to these kinds of absurdities, mistakes, what have you. Um, because that's how you'll kind of get through to your young readers. Um, this did not stay popular forever, but it, it worked for a little while in, in children's literature. Um, so uh, the didactic, very heavily ideologized content of children's literature, um, which is probably the better known kind of aura of er early Soviet children's literature that people talk about, um, was of course very strong. Um, 
Uh, and again, for those of you who maybe have worked on this period, like the 1920s basically was a period where everybody was coming out with different ideas about how Soviet children's literature could be. And there wasn't really a, um, a top-down consensus until, of course, Stalinism comes in in the late 20s, early 30s. Um, so here, though, I just want to point out um, uh, this kind of obvious visual language, right? So you don't, it doesn't even necessarily matter so much what the content of these books um, is. Same thing, I'll just flip ahead. Even, even the color scheme, right, with all of these is, is following a pretty straightforward um, model. <clears throat> uh, and so, you know, this is on the left hand, this is a Yiddish language edition of, a, it's a Yiddish translation of Richard Kipling, The Elephant Child. On the, on the right hand, it's Where Do, Dis Where Do Dishes Come From? Um, uh, one of the, uh, one of my favorite genres of, of early Soviet children's literature. And, but, but they're all following the same kinds of, um, visual language and basically didactic thrust, right? Um, Mayakovsky, who was a very prominent pre-revolutionary futurist poet, uh, was the only one of that initial group to dive really into children's literature um, after the revolution. And his children's literature is pretty, his children's poetry is pretty bad, mm -hmm. uh, like compared to his adult stuff. Like he, he, he so thoroughly went for the didactic line and um, I forgot, oh no, yeah, so you can see the title. This is like about as didactic as, as it gets, right? Literally, what is good and what is bad. Um, <clears throat> so I'm showing you these things partly for contrast because in, 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 in these very didactic, didactically oriented um, early Soviet children's books, there isn't actually a lot of what I think of as the childlike aesthetic, right? So this is, um, uh, this is more like, kids, this is how the world is, and this is how you should now be, um, as opposed to following these uh, recommendations that Tchaikovsky was making. Um, so uh, Samuel Marshak is the other of the two big names of early Soviet children's literature with Tchaikovsky. Um, and he was very involved in these debates that were raging throughout the 1920s about how, how it should be, how things should be. Uh, and he threw in with the childlike aesthetic um, um, so he, and here we go to some more familiar faces, he was involved in bringing the poets we now know as the Abriu poets, um, into children's literature. So they were kind of just, uh, messing around, staging performances in the late 1920s in Leningrad, and he brought them into the major Leningrad publishing house as freelance, they weren't like staff. They weren't in the writers. Well, there wasn't a writer's union yet. Um, but uh, he deliberately sought them out because they were known for wordplay, absurdist elements, um, <clears throat> these elements of what I have described as the childlike aesthetic, uh, which Marshak very programmatically felt needed to be more represented in children's books at the time. Um, uh, so it's they are kind of my starting point in some ways. I know I've been talking for a little while already, but for what the, the argument that I that I try to make in the book, it's important to me both that they are brought into children's literature, but also that they are what we think of as the first Soviet underground. So they were experimental writers who did not have the option um, of publishing their work in the official press. Um, you know, in some ways they just were historically unlucky. They came of age as writers, right, as things started to heat up or freeze over, depending on which metaphor you prefer. Um, and also they didn't really want to write children's literature, which is another important point about most of the heroes of my book. Uh, some of them were quite good at it, uh, but most of them didn't want to be children's writers, either because they hated children or because children's literature um, even when it's acknowledged as a really important genre, is not as prestigious as adult literature. And this, you know, this carries through to our context and the present day, like, uh, there's still a lot of prejudices there. Um, and they are also my starting point because they're writing these children's poems, but these childlike elements keep cropping up in their adult work, 
Um, so just to give you one quick example of this, another little poem to read. All the poems in this presentation are pretty fun to read, except for some of the ones at the end. So this is a, a late poem by Clarence called Visiole Starichok. Жёлый свете старичок маленького роста, и смеялся старичок чрезвычайно просто. Ха-ха-ха, да хе-хе-хе, хи-хи-хи, да бух-бух, бу-бу-бу, да б-б-б, дин-дин-дин, да трюк, трюк. It's just a, a part of the poem, but I won't give you the whole the whole thing. So this is the children's poem. It was published uh, as such. And then um, an earlier poem by Carms that was not published in his lifetime um, and was not identified as a children's poem. This is the, it's a, it's a longer poem. It's kind of dialogue. Um, uh, this is the end of it. Um, so this is the, the water and Hnu are having a conversation. Прощай, вода, ты меня не любишь, вода, да. Твои ноги слишком тонкие. Я ухожу. Где мой посох? Хнил. Ты любишь чернокосых? Вода. Жирк-жирк. Лю-лю-лю. Жорч-жорч. Клюб-клюб. Клюб. Все. Um, so here, like, pretty obviously an adult poem, right? Like, there's this kind of romantic uh, element, um, uh, frustrated romantic element. Uh, but you have this 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 tendency toward borderline nonsense wordplay. I mean, the the sounds the water makes are sounds that water makes, but water has pre prior to that been speaking in Russian, and then starts speaking in water. Uh, uh, also, this ending is a very characteristic harms ending, right? Like this is which is also something you see all the time in in children's literature, um, and he does it in the children's poems as well. <clears throat> uh, and at the same time, like, uh, not only is the, I, I mentioned this romantic context, but it's also, uh, I think, a very effective use of, you know, the, the switch into water language. It's kind of um, also a very adult sort of thing about the, the communication failure, right? Um, but it's being done by means of elements that otherwise, especially in harms, you might associate with, with writing for children. Um, obviously, this would never have been publishable in the very uh, limited sense of what poetry could be at the time it, it was written. Um, so, um, oh, okay. So I'm going to pause before I go to the next slide. Um, ordinarily, I uh, when I talk about the book, I, I at this point I skip into the thaw period, which is where most of the book happens. Um, but uh, since today I'm trying to think more about the childlike aesthetic in poetry that has to do with war and that has to do with traumatic experience, I do in the book, I talk about this poem by Gennady Gore. So I thought I would talk about that here today. So I don't know if uh, people are aware or familiar with the work of Gennady Gore. He was a... Um, best known in the Soviet period as a uh, science fiction writer. He was a fairly successful um, official science fiction writer. He, in his youth, was friendly with the Abriu poets. They hung out together in Leningrad. And Gennady Gor was in Leningrad during the first um, most terrible winter of the siege of Leningrad, the winter of 1941. Um, and uh, it was only after his death uh, that his family found like this secret notebook that was full of poems that no one could even believe that he had written um, because it was so, so foreign to what people associated with him and his work. Um, but these were poems that he wrote during that, during that time. Um, and so I'll just read this poem. Здесь лошадь смеялась и время скакала, река входила в дома. Здесь папа был мамой, а мама мычала. Друг дворник выходит, налево идет, дрова он несет. Он время толкает ногой. Он годы пинает и спящих бросает в окно. Мужчины сидят и мыло едят, и невскую воду пьют, заедают травою. И девушка мочится стоя, там, где недавно гуляла, там, где ходит пустая весна, там, где бродит весна. Um, so Gore is 
And this is characteristic of this whole body of poems that he wrote during this period. Um, he uses also very pointedly childlike language and form. You know, there are these there are these kind of broken nursery rhythms that are, keep popping up in this poem. Um, uh, even also a kind of naive viewpoint um, to describe like impossible experience, right? Um, and there's been a lot of really excellent scholarship on this that I'm passing over very, very briefly here. Um, but I want to just mark it as part of the narrative that I'm laying out because I think it is relevant to when this childlike aesthetic is going to come back in in a more contemporary context. So indeed, fast forwarding to the thaw now, um, the thaw period, again, as many of you know, was characterized by a big avant-garde revival. Um, this included the republication of harms for the first time since uh, he perished in prison in 1942, also in the siege of Leningrad. Uh, this was a historic republication of children's poems by Harms. Um, uh, the avant-garde revival encompassed like all of these different areas of the arts. It wasn't just in children's literature, but it was, it was very marked um, there. Uh, and um, experimental writers in this period were still stuck in children's literature. And uh, a lot of the artists were too. So again, just as a kind of visual aid, these are some images from publications of this time. A lot of the artists are these like, basically who became the famous artists, canonical artists of the 20th century, Ilya Kabakov, Viktor Pivavarov, um, uh, Eric Bulatov, Alek Vasilyev. And you can see that they are, they are also drawing on that early Soviet aesthetic in a lot of what, in a lot of what they're doing. So, the childlike aesthetic is still very much alive and well. And an important difference, though, is that in this post-war period, it has become historicized. It has become self-conscious um, in a way that was not the case for writers like Harms. So uh, there's even, you could say, an element of homage that comes in. So when you're an ex if you're an unofficial experimental poet writing in the thaw period and employing elements of the childlike aesthetic, there is a sense that you are, there's an added layer of saying, I know what happens to people like Harms, right? Like I am aware of this history of experimental poetry, which already exists, that is stuck in children's literature. Um, and this relates to reception as well, right? So people, people who are reading, you know, Children's literature is always written for the parents as much as it is for the children. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's an awareness as you read it of what's going on. You get the cue. Um, so uh, a sort of a historical parallel with the Abriyu poets could be drawn with the poets uh, that we now call the Lianozova group. Lianozova is just like a little town on the outskirts of Moscow, um, but it was where uh, a bunch of unofficial artists and poets were gathering in the mid late 1950s. Um, and uh, once again, several of them, including these three guys on the bottom, are drawn to working in children's literature by some of the editors of the, of the children's publishing houses and journals. Um, at this point, uh, I want to make a brief digression uh, and explain an image that I gave you on the opening slide, because um, it relates to Lianozova. So um, there's this there's this phenomenon in post-war Moscow of um, uh, experimental innovative artists and writers kind of convening on the outskirts. And one of the other uh, really well-known and related groups was a bit later called Collective Actions. Probably some of you have heard of them, Andrei Monastirsky, a poet and artist. Um, and uh, in 1977, there was this action using a banner that is deliberately designed to mimic Soviets like marching parade banners, white text on red background um, that they hung in this just out of town location outside of Moscow. And it says, I have no complaints and I like everything despite the fact that I've never been here and know nothing about this place. I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't relate this directly in any way to the um, childlike aesthetic, but it is a, a, a neighboring 
um, artistic tendency. And um, um, just this past spring, after the uh, invasion of Ukraine, um, an anonymous group did a remake um, that updates, uses the same kind of image, but updates the message um, in, a, in, a, in a very significant way. I'm howling with pain and I absolutely don't like anything despite the fact that I lived and grew up here and thought that I knew everything about this place. Um, so total digression, um, really only relevant for placing the uh, poets who I'm now, who I'm now talking about um, in geographical space. But we'll come back to this to this war war remakes in a minute. Um, so uh, just to give uh, again a brief example um, from the work of these post-war poets and their engagement with the childlike aesthetic, um, uh, the quotation which I'll read in a minute because it's very wordy, so maybe worth hearing out loud or not. I'm not sure. Um, uh, Another, another point that I want to make about the significant relationship between children's literature and this ongoing childlike aesthetic and experimental poetry is, uh, is, the, is, is the way that um, genre divisions are being questioned, right? In some ways, this takes us all the way back to the avant-garde, which was all about breaking down those kinds of divisions as well. Um, but it's also a, a more immediate critique of the very rigid Soviet literature system, which said, you know, we have quotas for this, 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 and this. Um, we have children's literature, we have adult literature, we have adventure literature, right? Uh, science fiction. Um, and so Nikrazov, uh, who was actually kind of a failure as a children's writer, he tried to publish for children and his manuscripts always were rejected, um, but he, he did, uh, he did want to be a children's writer. He writes, uh, I think the problem lies in the fact that I know how to write in a funny way for kids, but not only for kids. But I also know how and love to write not only in a funny way, not only funny and not only for kids, since in principle, I don't write for kids only, which distinguishes me unfavorably from the leading lights of children's literature who really do know how to write well in a funny way for kids, but only for kids. Um, and in fact, uh, when Nikrasov put together these manuscripts that were subsequently rejected um, uh, by these publishing houses, he basically would just go through his poems that he already wrote and be like, oh, this one, this one, this one. Um, and so he didn't write expressly for children, um, but he found that a lot of what he wrote, why not? You know, kind of like what we said about the Yelena Guro poem. Um, so just to give a couple of examples, this is a poem that he actually never did put into a children's, one of his children's books, but like, again, why not? Um, and I don't know if the joke is immediately obvious to people, but the idea here is the, the, the right? So the dots are, are like a knocking, you know, who's there? Dosh, kto zhishyo? Um, so this is also, you know, also a poem with a strong visual component and you could argue an oral as well. Um, but also a poem that a kid could get just as well as any of us in here, right? Um, uh, this is one that he did include in, um, a manuscript that he submitted as a child, as a children's manuscript to the Tietzka Literatura publishing house in Moscow, um, Da, kuda, ja znaju kuda, od kuda, od kuda ja znaju od kuda, nijet, od kuda, ete ja znaju od kuda, a kuda, od kuda ja znaju kuda, right, um, so, and this is also a book, that, this is also a poem that he included in every single one of his uh, post-Soviet adult, adult, uh, you know, normal, poetry publication. So not a poem that he considered exclusively for children, but that, you know, gaditsa. Um, <clears throat> uh, so in the, uh, in the book, I discuss quite a few of these post-war poets, both from this Lianozova milieu. I also talk about Igor Polin, um, also some Leningrad poets, Leonid Aranzon, 
Um, and I will give just one more example here of another Leningrad poet, Alia Grigoriev, um, <clears throat> just to just to give a slightly bigger bigger picture of this post-war scene. Um, so uh, Grigoriev. He was more successful than Nikrasov as a children's writer. He published, but he, that, that's relatively speaking, he published a grand total of three books for children in his lifetime, which was fairly short. Um, and they were very widely spaced. He was plagued by uh, censorship issues. Also, um, he was kind of a homeless alcoholic most for most of his life. Um, so not ideal circumstances. Um, Grigoriev is also someone uh, who I chose to include because of the way that he blurs to the point of indistinction the boundaries between genres. So, uh, and, and this is particularly evident with several of these poets in the way their po post-Soviet publication history shows, where they just put all these poems together like in one, in one book. Um, so the poem that's on the slide uh, is not a poem that was published in one of Grigoriev's children's books. But again, so I'll read it quickly. Люди куда-то стоят прямо, потом назад, под воротню, сквозь дом, в угол и снова кругом. Мы проверили с другом, ни лавки, ни продавца. Люди просто стоят друг за другом, без начала и без конца. So this is a poem where it kind of sounds like a children's poem. It pretty obviously features child protagonists. Um, um, and yet uh, it is making a commentary on a kind of uh, element of the reality of late Soviet life that uh, could be taken as completely adult, right, in its, in its concerns. Um, the other uh, two poems I wanted to share by, by Grigoriev are more obviously not for children. They definitely did not appear in his, in his children's books. Um, and they perform this really interesting role reversal where, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about kind of these abstract associations or conventional associations of children being innocent and fresh and so on. And um, uh, something really interesting about what Grigoriev does is he often reverses that and has the children as, as terrible villains. Um, and meanwhile, his speaker um, is very vulnerable, very weak, kind of powerless, um, especially in the face of this kind of aggression. So you can see in these two poems, um, maybe I'll just let you read the, uh, well, I'll read, uh, I guess they won't take that long, I'll just read them. Злые дети со счастливыми рожами по плечам моими коленям лазали. Дети ели большие пирожные и кремом меня нарочно мазали. Um, and then громадные выше крыш надо мной шелестели тополи. Подошел какой-то малыш и об меня вытер сопли. Um, so the, you have this 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 speaker um, who is basically standing there in a kind of torpor, right? And and terrible things are being done to him. I mean, not that terrible, cream, but um, and this is something that I want to get back to when I talk just now about the more contemporary stuff. So as I mentioned, um, uh, the final chapter in the book, it's kind of an epilogue, takes up these poets of the, these younger poets from the 90s and 2000s, um, who uh, in this post-Soviet context no longer have any connection to children's literature at all, but for whom the, the childlike aesthetic is really important, uh, remains really important. Um, and in my view, uh, what happens in the post-Soviet period is, is, is kind of another layer being added to the layers I've already discussed. So you have uh, this thing that stretches all the way back to modernism, the idea of the basic expression, expressiveness, um, potential for expression offered by the childlike viewpoint, still there, still relevant. You also have this homage to repressed early Soviet uh, poets that becomes important in the post-war period. And then finally, in the post-Soviet period, you have this added additional layer of people carrying the torch of underground poetics, right? So uh, a lot has been written about how 
basically the most important aspects of contemporary poetry are a continuation of this, these, these lines that come out of the unofficial tradition. And this childlike aesthetic is, is one of them. Um, finally, especially for this generation of poets who came of age in the 90s, um, in, in these difficult circumstances, uh, there's also a kind of escapism element that comes in, this idea that the childlike aesthetic is something that they're using for processing the, the, the tragedy of grown-up life, um, especially for a generation that arguably had to grow up fast. Um, so that, uh, from there, I want to transition into talking about the present moment, because, of course, this tragedy and generally, like, the 90s, which... Uh, we've talked about this post-Soviet transition. It looks very different now in light of this of this war um, that's happening. Um, and so at this point, of course, I'm going to try to do something slightly ridiculous because there could easily be and has been and should be an entire talk about the um, the most recent poetry being written in Russian that is uh, anti-war in nature. Um, there's also a lot to be said about the poetry that's coming out of Ukraine right now. Um, but I've been talking for a while, so I'm just gonna, I'm going to be brief. Um, and there has been a huge amount of, uh, of poetry just coming out in Russian since uh, almost a year ago, since February 24th, 2022. Um, there have been several attempts to organize this. So I just, just to throw two examples out, some of you may be aware of this. There's a, a sort of a almanac that uh, Linor Garalik has been organizing. I believe this is its. I believe it's in its fifth issue now, um, called Roar: The Russian Oppositional Arts Review. Um, there is an anthology of uh, poetry that actually was came out in Russia uh, uh, in the Ivan Limbach Press in Petersburg called Poesia Pasiedniva Vremini. Um, um, so this is a kind of untranslatable pun because it's like poetry of recent times, but also poetry of the last times, like apocalypse poetry. Um, uh, and so th these are just, just a testament to the huge outpouring that has been happening with this. Um, and as I said, there's a lot to say about it. Um, uh, there are some people who think that Russian poets should be silent right now, right? That is a, that is a, that is a valid viewpoint that has been voiced. Um, but the, for whatever it's worth, they haven't been silent. They have been writing a whole lot. And um, what I want to draw your attention to is uh, a bunch of the childlike aesthetic that is cropping up in this poetry that is being written explicitly in response to the war. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples um, to take one example of the childlike aesthetic as far as just using the forms, recognizable forms of children's poetry um, independently of each other. These two poets uh, are both doing rewrites of the mother goose rhyme. This is the house that Jack built. Um, this is, uh, both a parody of a well-known nursery rhyme, but it is also engaging with the tradition I've been telling you about because this poem is known to Russian readers uh, in the translation by Samuel Marshak. So it's, it's associated with this tradition of Soviet children's literature and not just more, in fact, than with like the English mother goose or anything like that. Um, so I went ahead, this is probably not that helpful to people who don't know Russian, um, I translated the one on the right because it uses very uh, simple language and basically is more or less the same in English as it is in Russian. The one on the left, those of you who read Russian can enjoy, it has a lot of really clever adult wordplay in it. Um, uh, but the gist of it is in the way that the, in the way that this nursery rhyme is, what is it, cumulative, right? It's a cumulative nursery rhyme. Um, uh, so uh, Leibov, starts with Crimea, um, you know, here is, here is Crimea that the Russian people love so much. Oh, number two, and here is Donbass to distract you from Crimea uh, that Russian people love so much, right? And then, oh, and here is Syria. Why do we have Syria? Oh, it's probably like Donbass to distract you from blah, 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 right? So it's, it's cumulative in the same, in the same way. 
So um, I would say, you know, this is this is more the childlike aesthetic at the level of parody, right? It is it is primarily functioning in that way, um, as opposed to in a more um, integral way that has to do with the way the, the poem is conceived at the outset. But it's still a noticeable use of childlike form to talk about more catastrophic content. Um, a much younger poet, uh, Daria Sirienka, who some of you may have heard of, she is uh, currently, she's a longstanding figure in uh, contemporary Russian feminism, and she currently uh, is a leading figure in something called the, um, uh, God, feminist anti-war movement, I think that's what it's called, yes. Um, and she published a, a selection of poems in July of 2022 that are called Poems Not About War, and they are all about war. Um, so uh, this is just one of them, uh, but most of them are, are really marked by what I think of as a childlike aesthetic. So I can read you uh, the Russian. Встаньте, дети, буквой Z. Лучше буквы в мире нет, нарисованная кровью полусвастика побед. Победили, победили, нас послали, мы убили. Ну а что, таков приказ, скажут вас, убьем и вас. Смерть, конечно, лучше жизни, свет, конечно, хуже тьмы. Днем победы над фашизмом, но фашисты – это мы. So you can hear these very regular rhymes, again, this kind of nursery rhyme type rhythm, um, and even engaging, I think, with some of the stereotypes of that very didactic uh, strand of children's literature that I mentioned in connection with Mayakovsky and so on, like um, with this opposition of death, life, light, darkness, you know, what is good and what is bad. Um, uh, if we if we have no questions later, um, I have another. I have her. I think very wonderful poem entitled "On the Death of Putin," um, but I saved it as a a teaser for the end. If we want to go back to it, um, <clears throat> uh, also one other thing I want to say about what Sirinka is doing is that uh, in her work with the um, with the feminist movement, feminist anti war uh, uh, activity. A lot of what they're doing is trying to reach people who are not politically engaged, women in particular, and they're really working very intentionally with what you might think of as kind of conventional discourses of femininity. So um, trying to, they, they have this, this magazine that they like hand, hand out to people's grandmothers, um, which gives them lots of like crosswords and uh, heartwarming stories, but also tells them to like resist the war. You know, and, and and so I think in some ways it's a little bit familiar. Like if you see what she's doing using discourse from children's literature, um, little children's songs in a poem like that as well. Uh, and my final example is this uh, poet German Lukomnikov, who really should have been one of the heroes of my book. Um, I just had too many to choose from. Uh, he is a... Um, uh, a long-standing master of minimalism. He has an entire book of palindromes, palindrome poems. Um, uh, and he has written, not, not, not early in his career, but he has written books for children as well. And he, and he does stuff like that he'll perform in a children's library and kids will come and listen to him. Um, so he's definitely somebody else who blurs those boundaries. Um, just the, just recently, like like uh, a month ago or something, um, he, there was this extraordinary publication of a big selection of his poems, which are all about the war. Uh, extraordinary because it was published in the journal Volga in Russia. Um, everybody is quite concerned about what might happen to him and the editors of Volga as a result of this. I don't think anything has happened yet. Um, everything is very confusing in Russia right now. Um, uh, and so you can see, I didn't translate these because he is like, he's just like a pun. He's like a walking pun. Um, I thought I would just let those of you who know Russian enjoy them and explain briefly um, that uh, 
So the first one, если долго говорить, что мы можем повторить, все, как говорится, может повториться. So this is a reference to people, um, uh, to the uh, line from Russian official propaganda that we can repeat, we can repeat it, meaning referring to our victory in the Second World War. And he says, if you, if you keep repeating that we can repeat it, then actually it might repeat, um, uh, uh, meaning the bad stuff. Uh, the second poem is a kind of mashup, like a, uh, what is it called, centon, of um, lines from the very famous Mandelstam poem about Stalin um, and the lines from Karni Chukovsky's very famous children's poem about the evil cockroach. So, Tarakai nie smiutsu usisha i siyayu ti vogelinisha. Prinisite ka mnie zveri vaših detušek, ja si od njih zaužinom skušajom. So, very strong reference both to the tradition of poetry standing up to the tyrant and uh, to the children's tradition uh, set down by Chukovsky. And finally, another reference to that same Mayakovsky, um, uh, Mandelstam poem, Мы живем под собой, не чуя то, что чуять не чуть не хочу я. So you can see why I did not undertake to translate that one because uh, of the sound play. But basically, a reference to the line from Mendelstam, we're we're sort of living in this state of unconsciousness. But um, but So these contemporary examples point, I think, as well to uh, uh, that aspect that I drew your attention to with Grigoryev of the uh, very vulnerable and non, like basically non-powerful, weak, and and also non-aggressive lyric subject, which I think is another form of resistance that is being uh, performed by these uh, contemporary poets. I completely understand where it's coming from, but I also recognize that it has a kind of political ambiguity to it, right? Because um, non-aggression is not the same necessarily as resistance. Um, and so uh, it's definitely something that I'm thinking a lot about in, in terms of seeing how this childlike aesthetic continues into the present day. Uh, so I really welcome your questions and thank you very much for listening this whole time. Uh, once again, for those of you joining over Zoom, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That will allow us to see your questions, your comments. We will relay those to our speaker. Anyone present? Or Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Ksenia Yovdarva, and uh, I'm from Ukraine. I'm a fellow in the Advisor Center of Europe and University. I actually have a lot of questions because <laughs> I uh, can remember some of their uh, poems, some of them I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I have uh, questions about the present time. Uh, do you think that uh, today the children's poetry diminishes its uh, value because children are so much exposed to their modern gadget, TikTok, and all these things? I just wonder, it's my question like a parent, for example. And another question about the present time and the war in Ukraine. Uh, do you think that uh, anti-war uh, poetry uh, of Russian origin and Ukrainian poetry, uh, what would be its implication on their cultural diplo diplomacy or not? Oh, two really great, huge questions. So um, uh, the first question, um, the state of children's literature in, I mean, your question is probably global, right? I mean, uh, uh, do children read books versus uh, consume other media? Um, but maybe I'll, I'll say a few things about more specific to the, to the Russian context. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, people in Russia give their kids iPads just as much as anywhere else. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, some, in some ways, a, a kind of depressing answer to your question is that um, there are some really excellent uh, children's publishing houses that are active in Russia today. Most of, They are overwhelmingly located in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, even now, in conditions of wartime and censorship, they are putting out some pretty extraordinary stuff. Uh, particularly, I would note that there's a, a, a new kind of Aesopian language, the idea of you know, talking about one thing via another thing, 
in that these uh, publishing houses for children are publishing a lot of books about other wars. So they're about, about like World War II experience, um, but, but from the point of view, for instance, not of like a victorious narrative, from the point of view of how horrible war is and how, and how it destroys lives. And so they can't obviously publish stuff about the war in Ukraine, but there is like a huge amount of, of, of their lines being devoted in that direction. However, this is only in these capital cities. And of course there are lots of issues with distribution um, and so I don't think they're reaching a ton of child readers. Meanwhile, uh, children's publishing in Russia, even well, obviously now, but even like a year ago, is really dominated by the Soviet classics. Um, and so in terms of what you can find if you go to a bookstore in, I don't know, Ufa um, or, or a smaller town further from further from cities, you'll get Tchukovsky, Marshak, right? You'll get these kind of Soviet classics, but you won't necessarily get translations of Swedish children's literature, which are very popular, you know, among the Moscow intelligentsia with their children or something like that. Uh, so in some ways, you might argue that this sends people even further in the direction of the iPad because uh, available really high quality children's literature, um, thought provoking children's literature, is not necessarily that available, you know, in, in Russian. Um, as far as like what to do with your own children, I don't know. Uh, my, my children are luckily like kind of scared of cartoons. Like they're very sensitive in this way that I find annoying, but so they don't watch them very much. Yeah. But they love reading comic books, graphic novels. That seems to be a happy middle ground. Um, so uh, as far as your question about um, poetry as a form of diplomacy, I, I have a kind of depressing answer to that too. I, I, I should preface it by saying, I hope very much that we get to that point. Um, but uh, I, the example I gave of these big outpourings, I have to say that my own impression of them is that their primary function is therapeutic for Russians, right? So it's Russians talking to Russians, even when, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of very emotional statements about how horrible, how I can't live with myself after seeing the images from Bucha kind of thing. But I think that it is a bit of a closed circle in a lot of, in a lot of how it is functioning. And in that sense, not very, diplomacy oriented. Um, uh, the other issue is, of course, language, because in Ukraine, uh, there is a very strong movement, particularly on the part of writers, to turn away from Russian, from, from using Russian. Um, and of course, uh, not that many Russians are learning Ukrainian. And so uh, there are some wonderful, very important figures like Stanislav Belsky, who is translating Ukrainian poetry every day into Russian and posting it, right? So, so there are people who are really working to keep those lines of communication open. Um, but otherwise, I think that there is uh, not, I don't see major spaces for dialogue that have opened up yet. I mean, I, I hope for it very much. I, I kind of, I really, I mean, this is, I mean, this is very inappropriate because I'm like absolutely uh, uh, on the sidelines here. I really want Ukraine to reclaim Russian and to have like its own Russian. And I think that in some ways, if that ever happens, maybe there would be more of a space, but I completely understand the rejection of Russian that has been happening. And I think that as long as the war is going on, it probably will stay like that. Other questions, please. Hello, my name is Oksana Kedrzov. I am also a fellow of the Common Scholars and this fellow of the Writers of the Federal Protection. Um, I will uh, talk, I will tell one sentence about my research that I continue to do in my fellowship. Uh, this is, uh, I'm interested in the participation of foreign um, architects. Uh, American architects and engineers in the early civilization period of 
in the Soviet Union. And now I will connect mm -hmm. this topic with the literature. So I, as an architect, uh, I was looking on some uh, poems which uh, uh, depict or describe the city or some locations of, of some functions in the city. For instance, Kardamama na Rabulke na Zabodish na Brodi. It, uh -huh. uh, I'm, I was finding the connection with the linear cities, uh, with the models of construction of new cities in Berlin in a certain session period of time. But I then I noticed that in some poems, for instance, in, in one of the poems in by Max Sharp, he writes uh, about, uh, so there's a the poem, uh, The War with the Dnieper, mm -hmm. the Dnieper River. It's actually about the construction of Dnieper as electric power, power station mm -hmm. in Zaporizhia. And in this construction were involved many American uh, firms, uh, as well as Cooper, and also uh, the equipment was brought. And in his poem, when he when it was published first edition in uh, 1931, 1935, he was mentioning in, in the lines like uh, uh, the equipment that was used uh, uh, that belonged to the American mm -hmm. companies like Sanders. Mm -hmm. But later, after the Second World War, uh, the this kind of poems didn't pass the censorship, and the words were substituted. So the word the word Sanderson was taken from the poem, mm -hmm. and um, um, because actually this information about participation of foreign engineers and architects uh, in the Soviet Union was after the Second World War, mm -hmm. it's kind of a gap in the history. Soviet Union didn't want to mention. Mm -hmm. They were always propaganda was telling the Soviet people made, made the design mm -hmm. of the surveillance. The question is have you found, have you seen any kind of this censorship that substitutes you know, the facts or the meanings in children's literature because it's uh, poems which um, were for children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I'm I um, just curious, uh, maybe you will just um, help me to find other examples. <laughs> um, so, so censorship or substitution or mm -hmm. erasing the history or erasing the facts. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is not so much just because in my particular research for this book, I was focusing overwhelmingly on poetry that wasn't that kind of poetry. Right, like I mean, that that's sort of the 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 children's poetry equivalent of the production novel genre, right? And there are a lot of children's books that are like that, um, that are about big construction jobs or um, uh, giant industrial undertakings. Um, but as a rule, uh, those are the kind of children's book that have very little of the childlike aesthetic that was interesting to me, um, because those are. Those are the children's books that are aiming at conveying information first and foremost. And this was a funny, um, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing to myself because, uh, so uh, a very famous poem by Karni Chukovsky, who I've discussed a bit, um, Krakadil, uh, famously was criticized by Krupskaya, by the wife of, of Lenin, um, because it contained very little useful information about crocodiles. Right. So this is a uh, this is a this is a poem um, that is uh, full of elements of the childlike aesthetic, but does not tell you very much about crocodiles. Whereas there were all of these books and and poems uh, that that actually, I mean, from a point of view of like all these STEM themed contemporary American children's books, like they're they're kind of uh, uh, full of useful information. Um, the one thing that immediately comes to mind, though, in terms of your ongoing research in this area is that uh, there were tons and tons of poems that featured the names of prominent Soviet politicians. And these would periodically, when they were reissued, they would have to be edited as this or that politician fell out of favor. Right. Um, and I, I love your example because it's really funny to think about what this, you know, publishing house uh, editorial assistant or whatever would come up with what rhymes with Sanderson, right? Like uh, what rhymes with, I don't know, um, Bulgarian or something, right? No, not Bulgarian. Uh, but no, otherwise, I um, the, the, the children's books that I read, 
I can't think of any that had like really tendentious. Um, most of most of the stuff that tended more toward wordplay, absurdity, like this kind of playful element, were also more politically kind of neutral in a lot of ways. And sometimes that, depending on the political climate, that sometimes got them into trouble because you weren't everything was supposed to be um, uh, politically charged. Uh, but yeah, so I can't think of anything as good as Sanderson, but I'll definitely bear it in mind. Thank you for the question. Uh, there's a question that came in over Zoom. It's from Alexandra uh, Katrova, who's a graduate student, Slavic, um, and she thanks you for your talk, uh, one, your wonderful talk, her words, mine too, but they're here. Um, and she asks a personal question. Do you ever get bored working with children's poetry? Can you still engage and indulge in these works? Um, or as a, as a reader of poetry, or do you maybe have to recruit kids to experience them more vicariously? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think it, I, I mean, so I cherry picked, right? Uh, for for certainly working on this book and in my ongoing uh, work with children's literature, there are definitely a lot of really boring children's books, um, both in the Soviet period and today. I mean, I have I have small children. I have to read them books all the time. Um, some of them are crushingly boring. Um, uh, but I, I, I would hazard the guess that, uh, I don't know, maybe this is just me and my um, overly strict literary tastes. I'm not sure that it's that different with adult literature either, right? I mean, like, like there's a lot of really, really um, just filler out there. Um, and not so many books that you encounter that are, you really find just just mind blowing. And I mean, adult poetry as well, which I, I work more with these days. Um, I haven't I haven't been working on a a children's project since the Yugoslav book that I did with Sasha Boshkovic, um, which was absolutely delightful all the way through and never boring. Um, plug plug that book. Um, uh, yeah, so I think um, in some ways, uh, boredom was an important criterion for me when I was working on this project because uh, reading a book, I mean, one of my, one of the, one of the poets I write about in the book, one of the Abriu poets, Alexander Vidyansky, he was very prolific as a children's writer and most of his books are terrible. I mean, he's like, he's a phenomenal poet. Um, uh, whose adult work you can just read without looking up for hours. But, uh, you know, he has these very boring books about Dievochka Masha where nothing happens and, like, the rhymes are pedestrian. Um, and so, you know, that that tells you something, right? Like, as you're, as you're reading, you're like, this is not good. What does that mean? Um, and so I, I think that uh, uh, in some ways getting bored was an important part of the research, uh, but it definitely happens. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I, I have, you know, we have wonderful, we have wonderful colleagues who study Soviet children's literature, and in some ways they study it in a more concentrated way than I have because my real interest in some ways was coming in from the adult poetry end and thinking about that relationship with the children's literature. Um, and so I, I think I would love to hear from some of them, some of the people who strictly work on children's literature you know, whether whether some of the maybe formulaic aspects of of the genre, whether they get sick of them. But again, I, I kind of think that it's probably like any other genre proportionately. Like if you have, if you read production novels, you're worse off. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, um it, it disembodied um Sasha. Yeah. Sasha. Yeah. Um, Actually, I want to follow up with that, yeah. with what you just said, because it's, um, I think those of us who are trained in Soviet literature, inevitably we come across at some point, especially in an avant-garde course, we're going to come across quite a bit of children's literature in quotation marks, mm -hmm. um, most of which is not written by or for children, and most of which is not written for people who even know children. By you know, like like it's mm -hmm. it's. You were very careful throughout your talk to refer to like childlike mm -hmm. uh, poetry mm -hmm. or childlike aesthetics. Um, 
And I, I'm wondering, I, I want to ask a question about translation. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's slightly personal for me insofar as whenever I, I, I still know quite a few poets in Central and Eastern Europe who write their children's book or mm -hmm. their children's poem inevitably published by their same publishers <laughs> like, they, like they do a book for kids yes or, uh -huh, yeah okay. usually yeah. with illustrations uh -huh. um betraying a total lack of uh -huh. interest yeah. in or understanding of children yeah, yeah. Uh, or of children's literature per se and when i translate this it is pretty reliable that the publisher in english will present it will repackage it as an adult poem mm -hmm. or as Chil a children's book for adults that's actually like they will use this kind of convoluted phrase mm -hmm. and um and that works fine because it's it's not dr seuss right um so i'm wondering how you approach that problem of translating mm -hmm. stuff that is clearly it, it's draw it, it's almost like we're using childlike or children's literature as a shorthand for something else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so um the the poets whose work I focus on in the book do fall into some categories, and some of them, like uh, immediately, I would say Liani Daranzon, um, who is a really uh, phenomenal poet from Leningrad in the sixties and seventies. Um, he uh, wrote some very pedestrian poems for children that were published in like journals and almanacs. Um, he had more that he had written. Um, he did some translations, which were like, you know, Soviet style translations, um, uh, mostly from Polish uh, of, of children's, actually really good children's poetry. Um, Steam is very good. That's what that's what gets translated usually. It, it, this is Jan, Jan Brzeva. Um, okay. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and and so like you know the only Aramzon poems for kids that are actually pretty good are his translations from Jeha, right? Like I mean, because he he he's a poet, he's a good poet, but he ne I think he needed that framework of someone else's work to produce a poem that actually would work as a children's poem. Um, and the rest of what he came up with on his own is is you know Vidyansky level bad for the most part. Um, uh, and he never really, he wasn't into it. Like he didn't, he didn't respect children's literature very much. Um, it was, it was just a, it was haltura, which is the, the word that crops up all over the place with most of these poets. Igor Holin, Igor Holin's poetry for children is better, but he didn't, he still didn't respect it. He, he thought it was, he thought it was um, just boring. Um, so <clears throat> I think that, uh, I think that most of them shouldn't have been writing for children and that it was it was less of an equal exchange and that they were getting a lot more from thinking about children's literature and then writing adult poetry than the other way, right? And and it's interesting and like I, I drew your attention to examples like Nikrasov and Grigoriev because in I think and, and harms really, I think it's actually more of a two-way street where um they produced pretty good work for children, just as they produced excellent uh, work work for adults. So, but I, I don't generally approve of <laughs> like, uh, you know, like these uh, these established poets, or I mean, another uh, example from the Soviet context, of course, would be Brodsky. He wrote um, at least, he only wrote a couple things for children, but they're also not great. Um, and, and there is this idea that like, oh, I'm a poet, so of course I can, I'm I'm an established poet. I, I'm good at poetry, so why not? I can write a children's poem, but actually, it kind of is like a um, something you have to. I, I I'm not sure. I, I I would hesitate to say you need to have a special skill that is called like children's poetry, but it just seems that um, you have to have a kind of discernment and know that you know what the kind of stuff I do is not going to work um, for children. I would be curious to know whether any of these poets that you've encountered in that capacity, whether you would characterize any of their adult work as having like, as working with a childlike aesthetic? In some cases, but always, but but yes, for uh -huh. sure, yeah. adopting a kind of uh, formal naivete. Uh-huh, uh-huh. 
that could only really be discernible to another discerning adult reader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's not, it's not something, it has no communicative mm -hmm. capacity with children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's also interesting that, uh, you know, all of the contemporary poets I know writing in Russian now don't like nobody writes for kids. There's like this one Igor Rukov writes children's books, but I don't even know what his adult work is really like. Um, so it, it's interesting that, I mean, some of that I think is has to do with the uh, institution of publishing changing and um, everything getting actually a lot more kind of market oriented, um, but also, also maybe an awareness that if you don't have to, Right. In the way that a lot of these guys, were, that was the only option for even not just not just they didn't make that much money doing it, but like they had their through the Vaya Knishka, they had, you know, they were established as employed, at least as freelance writers. Yeah. Yes. So I have kind of a question about markets and I'm thinking about what's happening in the United States and the UK in the 20th century in this period. And not so much with poetry, but with children's literature in general. It's, and commodification of Disney and even like A. a. Milne, which in a way with who is a little bit experimental, but it just becomes this kind of, you know, just the product starts to dominate the any kind of um, literature that's there. So I guess I would just would invite you to think a little bit about the extreme commodification of children's literature. If there are avant-garde kind of poet type people writing for children in English or just any sort of comparative mm. thoughts that you have. And also if there is this kind of intense marketing around children's literature that's happening now because now it seems like it's both the story and the toy hmm. mm -hmm. um um so i i think it's always really interesting to compare those contexts because some aspects of the rigidity of the soviet genre system kind of go along with this commodification idea, right? Like everybody, everything kind of is very neatly distributed and um, you know what, you, there's like a, a brand loyalty or something, like you know what you're getting. Um, and there were all these subdivisions like under the awning of Soviet children's literature that, you know, um, and and everything was mapped out with quotas. And, and I imagine that a lot of like contemporary publishing looks like that. Um, and also is like aimed at specific age segments in the same way that that was. Um, so that's a funny kind of comparison. Uh, obviously you don't have, it's only I think in the in the later, pretty late Soviet context, and there's probably people in the audience who can correct me. Um, you know, there's like Chiburashka dolls and there's kind of an, I don't know how much of this stuff happened in the post-Soviet period though. Cause like right now, like there's a whole industry around like Vinny Puch, the, the the Soviet version of Winnie the Pooh, um, uh, and 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 all of these other heroes again demonstrating how much Soviet era children's literature still dominates the market. Like these are kind of the recognizable figures, and you can get like a Carlson doll and and stuff like this. Um, <clears throat> I don't uh, uh, that and all of that is certainly true in today's Russia. I mean, post Soviet Russia the market rules, like there are all kinds of even local cartoon characters and relating to our first question about um, what uh, what kids read or watch. Um, uh, as far as comparison with uh, thinking about the, the relationship between experimental poetry and children's literature, there's some interesting example. I mean, like there's, you know, Gertrude Stein, Gertrude Stein wrote um, uh, at least a couple children's books that I think are really cool. I'm not sure how many kids ever read them. I think it's kind of a similar uh, a similar problem there. Um, I always like to think about Maurice Sendak uh, because um, he also, I think, had a, a complicated relationship to actual children, um, um, somewhat like some of our some of our heroes. Um, and 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 yeah, I think that the like the 1950s was a really interesting time. I don't know that much about it in 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 the U.S. in terms of who was writing children's literature and what this sort of like debauched um, uh, experimental adult scene. Um, so so I, that would be really cool to learn more about. And I, I I can't say that much for right now. I also don't know. Uh, getting back to the market again, which is sort of where you always end up, right? Um, 
I don't know how much space there is in children's literature today in the U.S. for if you are a, an experimental poet who actually would like to publish stuff for children. Um, I can tell you I have had many unanswered uh, letters. I've been trying to write to independent children's presses because I really want to publish the Yugoslav poem that Sasha and I translated, The Fine Feats of the Five Cockerels Gang. It currently is available only in a vastly overpriced academic edition. Um, uh, and I would love for it to come out actually as a children's book, um, just without all the scholarly apparatus. Um, and so I've been I've been knocking on the doors of independent presses to see if anybody wants to publish a children's poem from 1933 Yugoslavia. And I have nobody has answered me. So as far as welcoming uh, welcoming the avant-garde aesthetic in American children's literature today, so far no dice. <laughs> Um, I think that we, given uh, the constraints of time, we should leave it there with uh, no a dice. plea, with no <laughs> dice, and a plea to um, American publishers to wake up to the cool stuff that's that's available. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking our speaker one more time. Thank you.